welcome back to the second semester. How were your holidays? It was really fun. I went with my family to London for oh, a few wow. weeks. Mm. But I think Asana may have misrepresented me while buying some souvenirs. Despite me repeatedly asking him about the souvenirs, so I'm not really sure how I could go about this though. Wow. Shall we discuss whether this seller's mere silence amounted to misrepresentation, just for argument's sake? Sure thing. Well, to start, I shall explain that representation is a number of statements that are said orally or written before or during the process of contracting with a party. The purpose of these statements is to induce the representee into contracting with the other party. If a representation is incorporated into the contract, it is then considered a term. So that in case it is false, it equivalates to breaching the contract. Which brings us to our main topic of our discussion today, which is misrepresentation. Misrepresentation is an ambiguous false statement regarding a fact or law. And this occurs during the process of negotiations. There are of course some consequences of misrepresentation, which are the voidability of a contract that was induced by misrepresentation at the option of the innocent party. Oh yes, I know. But there are three types of misrepresentations following the decision in the case of Hadley, Byrne and Company. Which one are we talking about precisely? Well, yes, there's fraudulent, negligent and innocent misrepresentation. In my case, I believe it was fraudulent misrepresentation. It is known that fraudulent misrepresentation is the most serious. And in order for a statement to account as fraudulent misrepresentation, it has to have been made intentionally with the belief of dishonesty or recklessly without caring whether the statement is true or not, as per the case of Derry v. Peak. The court held in that case that fraud and misrepresentation must have the intention of deceiving the purchaser, and the purchaser must have depended on that representation and not on his own inquiries. In this instance, a claimant may seek some remedies where they can retrieve all the loss that was directly a result of the defendant's breach of contract to put them back in the same position they would have been in considering the representation hadn't occurred. And that is under damages in tort of deceit. Ah, yes, I see. Now, let's answer the main question. Can silence amount to an untrue statement? The general rule is that even if mere silence involves hiding a highly significant fact, it does not constitute a false statement. And if a representation could be made by silence alone, it would seem inconsistent considering the self-regulatory nature of contract law. Wow, so the general rule is that mere silence is not misrepresentation. But if I remember clearly, there surely is some exceptions to this rule, right? Yes, you are right. The first exception is contracts requiring utmost good faith, or also known as contracts uberime fide. The nature of relationship between parties may create an obligation to disclose all relevant information and failing to do so may amount to a misrepresentation. This is shown in the case of Pan Atlantic Insurance against Pine Top Insurance as it was held that a key requirement in insurance contracts is that both parties must disclose material factors relating to the contract which would affect the decision of a prudent insurer. This is because the insured is in a better position to provide all relevant information, or maybe the only person able to provide such information. And so, imposing a high standard of disclosure would be justified in such contracts. Right, and I remember another exception. A fiduciary must disclose material facts to the beneficiary. An existing relationship between parties can give rise to duty to disclose facts about a contract, such as a, a solicitor and a client. But I also believe that there are certain limited situations in which silence can form the basis of an actionable misrepresentation, right? Yes, that's right. But not just that. There are various case decisions and legal precedents used to establish a number of vital points where silence may amount to a fraudulent misrepresentation. These situations are not true examples of complete silence amounting to a false statement, but they are more concerned with the situations in which a statement has been made and important information is withheld. 
The first example is the active concealment of defects in goods sold. This is shown in the case of Schneider and Heath, where a ship was sold to be taken with all faults. Its hull was rotten and the captain kept her constantly afloat to cover up its defects. And after the sale was concluded, the buyer found out and sought rescission and recovery of the deposit. The second situation is when a true statement has been made, but there is a suppression of material facts. This may amount to misrepresentation, as in the case of Dimock and Hallett, where a seller told the buyer that the farms on the land were let, but he did not mention that the tenants were about to leave. The court held that there was a misrepresentation. On top of that, let me add some other instances from what I remember. Partial non-disclosure may amount to misrepresentation, as per the case of Peak v. Gurney. Lord Chancellor Kemsford mentioned before that half a truth will sometimes amount to a real falsehood, so a positive misrepresentation. And literal true statements, but with partial non-disclosure, may amount to misrepresentation, and that is in the case of Knott's Patent Brick and Title Company v. Butler. There was misrepresentation even though the solicitor's statement was literally true. He was held to be making statements which were calculated to lead the other side to believe that he was stating facts of his own knowledge. And his statements did in fact mislead them so that what he said amounts to a misstatement of facts. That's correct. And continuing on from your points, the fifth situation is subsequent falsity. Where a statement made was true, but has become incorrect by the time it is acted upon. And keeping silent when so can amount to a misrepresentation. This is found in the case of Whiff and O. Flanagan, where the seller told the buyer that his medical practice was worth £2,000 a year, which was true at the time. But when the contract was signed, there was no income and it was held that the seller's failure to inform the buyer that his patients did not want to return was a misrepresentation. Lastly, voluntary assumption of responsibility. In the case of Banque Financière de la Cité and Westgate Insurance, the Court of Appeal suggested that a party might incur liability for remaining silent, where there was a voluntary assumption of responsibility by one party and reliance on that assumption by the other. Wow, thanks a lot for the discussion. I believe we have learned a lot from it. Hmm, what if this situation happened in Malaysia? I wonder what would be the case. And now, let us listen in to a conversation between two friends regarding would mere silence amount to misrepresentation in Malaysia? Thank you. Hi Clement, long time no see. You find me for what? Looks like you have a very urgent things want to say to me. Uh, hi Jashen. I have some issue about mere silence want to clarify with you. Uh. Are you free now? Of course lah bro. Come, just ask me anything. Um, Jashen, uh, from what I know right, the law on fraud or fraudulent misrepresentation in Malaysia is quite similar to the English law under the Section 17 of the Contract Act 1950, right? Yeah, you are right. But not only that, the general effect of fraud or fraud misrepresentation in Malaysia is also similar to the English law under Section 19, Subsection 1, you know. In this section, when consent to an agreement is caused by coercion, fraud or misrepresentation. The agreement is a contract voidable at the option of the party whose consent was so caused. Also, Section 19, Subsection 2 of the Contract Act 1950 also provided that a party to a contract whose consent was caused by fraud or misrepresentation may, if he came fit, insist that the contract shall be performed and that he shall be put in the position in which he would have been if the representation had been met, have been true. Oh, I see. Why? You got fraud or had been misrepresented fraudulently by someone? 
No la bro, I have not got any fraud or had been misrepresented fraudulently by anyone. It's my girlfriend la. She asked me to sue someone as the LV bet she had bought was a not off product. She was so angry when she discovered that. And she told me that la, when she asked the seller whether the bet is original, the seller just remained silent, you know, and he refused to answer her questions. She thought she was fraud by the seller. <laughs> then you just sue that seller lah. You are a big lawyer, right? Hey bro, it's not joking time lah. Come back to the issue. I want you to help me uh, to give me some advice. From what I know, right, I think I can brought an action against the seller under the section 70, subsection B of the Act, which provided that active concealment of fat amounts to fraudulent misrepresentation. Besides that, I think I can also use illustration C and D of section 19 to support my action. As I know, in illustration C, after finding an early van on A's property, B used deceitful tactics to keep the Ori's discovery a secret from A. B is able to protest the estate for less thanks to A's ignorance. As a result, A has the opportunity to void the agreement. Moreover, in illustration D, A was given the right to inherit an estate after B passed away. C was informed of B's passing and C prevented the information reaching A. Then A was persuaded to sell C his share of the estate. The sale may be revoked at the discretion of A. I think by the action of refusing to answer my girl's friend question, uh, the seller was actually actively preventing the fact that the bet was a knockoff product. Therefore, I think I can rely on Section 17B to take action against the seller, right? What do you think? Yeah, what you have said about the Section 17, Section B and the illustration of Section 19, which explain the operation of Section 17, Subsection B are all correct. However, I just want to point out to you that in this circumstance, the seller may argue that his actions cannot amount to fraud because he was merely silenced about the question asked by your girlfriends. From the two illustrations you stated just now, we know that for someone to rely on Section 17, Subsection B, Active steps must be taken by one party either to conceal fact from the other party or prevent it from coming to his attention. If there is no active step taken, you may not be able to rely on these sections. The seller may argue that there is no any active step taken. He was just remaining silent and under the simulation law, Mere silence does not amount to fraud under Section 17 of the Act. Similar to the English law, there is no general duty of disclosure under Malaysian law. In the explanation to Section 17, mere silence as to fact likely to affect the willingness of a person to enter into a contract is not fraud, unless the circumstances of the case are such that it is the duty of the person keeping silent to speak or unless his silence in, is in self-equivalent to speech. Illustrations A and D to section 17 show how the general rule regarding non-disclosure operates. In illustrations A, A sells a horse to B at auction even though A is aware of its soundness. Regarding the horse's conditions, A said nothing to B. This is not fraud in A. Moreover, in illustration D, A and B enter into a deal since they are trader. Private information about a pricing adjustment that A is aware of could influence B's decisions to move forward with the contract. A is not required to tell B. You have to alert for this when you rely on section 17, section B to take against actions the back seller. Yeah, I actually had thought for this before. However, as you mentioned, there are some exceptions to the general rule that mere silence or non-disclosure does not constitute to fraud, right? 
If I'm not mistaken, illustration B and C to section 17 actually show how the exceptions to the rule operate. In illustration B, B is A's daughter and has just come of age. Here, the relation between the parties will make it A's duty to tell B if the host is unsound. Furthermore, illustration C provided that B says to A, if you do not deny it, I shall assume that the host is sound. A says nothing. Here, A's silence is equivalent to speech. I think my girlfriend's situation is similar to the situation given in the illustration C. Ah. When the seller refused to answer my girl's friend question, my girl's friend actually told the seller that if you still remain silent, I shall assume that the bet is original. Even my girlfriend come up with this statement, ah, the seller still remain silent, you know, and just smile at her. Therefore, I think these circumstances actually fall under the exception to the general rule of mere silence. Seems like you got a well prepared to help your girlfriend to sue the seller already. Yeah, I think you can rely on the illustration C you mentioned just now if the seller raises the issue of mere silence. However, just to remind you for the last thing, it is about the duty to discover truth with ordinary diligence. This is the big difference between the English law and the Malaysian law. There is no duty to discover truth with ordinary diligence in English law. For example, in the case of Norton versus Lord Edberston, the court held that nobody has the right to make statements that appeals wrong impressions and then justify themselves by claiming and claiming then person they had they say had available to do the correction. However, in Malaysian law, this is available under the exceptions to section 19 of the Contract Act 1950. Under this section, the contract is not voidable if the consenting party had the means to discover the truth with ordinary diligence. If consent was caused by misrepresentation under section 18 or by the silence fraudulent within the meaning of section 17. For example, in the case of the cell debt Kuala Lumpur Satyam Berhad versus On Chun Khoi, the plaintiff brought an action against the defendant to rescind the tenancy agreement on the ground of misrepresentation. The alleged misrepresentation by the defendant in this case was that there was no restriction on usage imposed on the title of the land. The High Court judge in this case held that the plaintiff had the means of knowing about the any condition imposed on the title of the land by means of the simple land search at land office. Hence, this case fails within the accession to Section 19 of the Contract Act 1915. Based on the both, a presentee must make reasonable, reasonable efforts based on the means available to him or her to ensure the representations made by the presenter is true. This is also an argument which may be brought out by the seller. The seller may argue that your girlfriend should discover the truth with ordinary diligence and hence, the contract cannot be voidable under Section 70. Yeah, that is true. This abstraction of Section 19 can be one of the arguments from the seller. However, I would definitely avoid the seller to rely on this by proving that my girlfriend was already had the means to discover the truth through extraordinary. For example, in the case of Gema Kota Enterprise Sandrian Brahat versus Public Ben Brahat, Gema Kota Enterprise had successfully bid for the property which had been misdescription by Public Ben of the area and terrain of the property. The Gema Kota Enterprise later sought to rescind the contract and recover the deposit as his surveyors discovered the wrong of the property in the report. The court subsequently held that the exception to Section 19 did not apply in the case as the innocent party already had the means to discover the truth through extraordinary. Therefore, the contract is voidable and the Gemakota Enterprise can resign the contract and recover the deposit from the public bank. As regarding to my girlfriend's situation, 
it is hard for a non-expert to distinguish the knockoff product and original product. In order to discover whether the bed is original, my girlfriend actually did something extraordinary by re requesting an expert to check for it. Also, in the event of buying the bed, she had asked so much questions but the seller just remained silent. Therefore, I will use this case to support my point if the seller raised the issue of duty to discover the truth with ordinary diligence. And okay, lah. seems like you had a well prepared to sue the LV back seller for your girlfriend. Just go for it and maybe you can get your money back. Of course, lah. I need to have worked hard for that. I want my money back. Ma. In fact, I don't know why she still can buy the bag from the seller under these circumstances. Ah. Maybe she always cannot stand the temptation to buy the bag. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alright, from the discussion above, we can actually conclude that what Wiscal Malham say was actually not wrong. In general, Mere silence will not support an action of deceit. However, of course, this subject to some exceptions which we already discussed above. In a nutshell, we can conclude that mere silence is only morally wrong but not legally wrong, except when the exception we discussed above has taken place. That's all our presentation. Thank you.